poet George Gordon Knoll, the sixth Baron Byron, Lord Byron, died 200 years ago this month. Not being of a poetical inclination myself, I will leave it to others better qualified to discuss his significance and reputation as both a poet and a man. But in this video, I will focus on the things I know about, the extraordinary arrangements for the repatriation of his body from Greece when he died, his burial in Nottinghamshire, the opening of his burial vault in 1938, and lastly, the bizarre story that has been circulating on the internet that makes extraordinary claims about the size of the dead poet's phallus. Byron's life was turbulent and interesting, and he lived life at a remarkable pace. A peer of the realm from a long-established Nottinghamshire family, at the age of 10 he inherited both his title and large estates centred on Newstead Abbey in Nottinghamshire. Both his father and his great-uncle, from whom he inherited his title and estate, had squandered their fortunes. Despite having an estate that was in financial difficulties, like them, Lord Byron liked to spend and he lived above his means. He developed her reputation in his younger years for very lax morals. There were rumours of incest with his half-sister Augusta and even that he had fathered a child with her. There were dalliances with a string of actresses, resulting in at least two more illegitimate children. In 1815, he married Anne Isabella Milbank, but despite a child coming along, Ada, uh, the marriage quickly soured due to his money worries, his incessant drinking and his erratic behaviour, and it was over within a year. Madness and genius are often two sides of the same coin, and alongside this behaviour which Anne thought insanity, he was already writing the poetry that cemented his reputation as one of the major figures of the Romantic movement in England. He left England in 1816 when his marriage broke down, never to return again. While living in Switzerland, he formed a strong friendship with another romantic poet, Percy B. Shelley, and he and his wife Mary Shelley became firm friends. Byron also became acquainted with Mary's stepsister, Claire Claremont, and they started a romantic affair. They all moved around the continent together until the group broke up following Shelley's death by drowning in 1822. During this time in Switzerland, Byron sold his family home, the Newstead Abbey estate. In 1823, bored by a somewhat aimless existence, Byron suddenly moved to Greece, then in the grip of a war of independence from the Ottoman Empire, and the final brief phase of his life was spent supporting that cause. He poured his energy, his influence, and now considerable fortune from selling his estates into this cause. He moved to Messalonghi, the heart of the independence movement, and intended from there to gather, lead and equip forces against the Ottomans. He found the Greeks to be hopelessly divided amongst themselves and used his efforts to unite them. He said it was his wish to spend his entire fortune pursuing Greek independence. It was an exhausting task, but for his efforts, Byron, rather divided in England, was fated as a hero in Greece. In February of 1824, Byron fell ill with a fever. The usual treatment at the time was bloodletting, which of course weakened his constitution. He did recover a little, but in April of that year, he caught yet another fever. Yet more bloodletting left him exhausted and unable to recover his strength. At six o'clock on the 18th of April 1824, Byron told his companions he was exhausted and sleepy and went to bed. He promptly fell asleep descending quickly into a coma, with all attempts to rouse him failing. At a quarter past six, the evening of the 19th of April, he was seen to open his eyes momentarily and immediately shut them again. And then he was gone. He just simply slipped quietly away. Byron was only 36, and like so many great people, he had crammed more than one lifetime's endeavours into his brief years. It was decided that given his now great fame, his body would be repatriated to England, so it was prepared and embalmed. The medical men who performed this work enclosed the poet's heart, his brain and intestines in separate vessels, and they were then placed in a chest lined with tin and preserved in spirits so that they would survive the voyage. The poet's body was placed in a rude, ill-constructed chest of wood with a black mantle draped over it as a pall, and on his coffin was placed a helmet, a sword, and a wreath or crown of laurel leaves. This is the original laurel wreath. 
His body was then taken to the church in Metalohi, where, according to Orthodox practice, the coffin was left open while the funeral services were performed, and he lay there until the 23rd in repose, while hundreds of Greeks came to pay their respects to him. His body was then removed to his own home, and the rustic coffin finally closed on the 29th of April. There is a theory that Byron's heart remains in Greece at Metalonghi and was placed in the cenotaph that was erected in the Garden of Heroes there. But as we will see, that is not in fact the case. Lord Byron's coffin was then taken to Zante and after some weeks of delay, it finally left for England on May the 25th on board a ship called the Florida for what was a three day voyage to London. On reaching England, it seems that Byron's body was placed in a finer coffin provided by a London undertaker with a matching urn for his heart, his brain and his entrails. And then the coffin and urn lay in state at 25 Great George Street, only a stone's throw from Westminster Abbey. And for two days, people came to pay their respects. The hope had been that he would be buried in Westminster Abbey, but the Dean and Chapter of Westminster refused the request as they considered Byron's behaviour too scandalous to warrant burial in Poet's Corner. Overtures to the Dean of St Paul's likewise fell on deaf ears. The Greek establishment and the Orthodox Church treated Byron with great honour, but there was no honour and no forgiveness in the moralistic society of Regency England. After six weeks and with no success in finding a burial place in the capital, Byron's half-sister Augusta, who was his chief mourner, decided that his body should be brought back to Nottinghamshire to be buried in the Byron family burial vault in the parish church of St Mary Magdalene at Hucknall Torcard, a few miles from Newstead Abbey. The coffin in one hearse and the urn placed in another were taken by road to Nottingham, the cortege resting along the way at Wellin, Higham Ferries and Oakham. A large cortege left London heading north with numerous empty carriages in it. High society in London were quite happy to make a show of attending by sending their carriage to join the cortege as it left the city, but they were not prepared to actually sit in them. When the cortege arrived at Nottingham, it was taken to the Blackmoor's Head Inn in Pelham Street, right smack in the middle of the town next to the marketplace, where thousands upon thousands of people are said to have come to view the coffin and the urn. On Friday, July the 16th, the funeral procession then moved off, passing north up Columbus Street and Mansfield Road, out into the Nottinghamshire countryside, moving slowly through the villages of Papplewick and Limby on the edges of the Newstead estate. The burial vault in the church at Hucknall was already opened and prepared to receive Byron's body, and apparently on the day of his burial, many people visited it, peering into what would be the poet's last resting place. Just after 4pm, on the 16th of July, 1824, nearly three months after Byron had died, the vicar of Hucknall, the Reverend Charles Nixon, read the funeral service from the Book of Common Prayer over the coffin, and the poet's coffin and the urn were buried in his family vault. As the coffin was lowered into the vault, the vicar stood within the communion rails at the head of the chasm, while a man bearing a baron's coronet on a crimson cushion stood at the top of the vault steps. The last action before the vault was sealed was to place the coronet on Byron's coffin. A wreath of ceramic flowers that had topped the coffin during the course of its long journey were laid up in the church. This wreath is now laid in an opening in the floor directly above the burial vault itself. The vault Byron was interred in at Hucknall Church was the last resting place of many generations of his family. It has been opened on several occasions, including in recent years during restoration work, but most of what we know about the form and the contents of the vault is from the opening of the vault in June of 1938. This opening work was initiated by Canon Thomas Barber, the Vicar of Hucknall, and he wrote a copious and detailed account of it in 1939, entitled Byron and Where He Is Buried. Barber had been Vicar of Hucknall for 24 years, and had developed something of an obsession with the poet. The work of opening the vault was undertaken with permission from the Home Office, and that of the then Lord Byron, 
who just happened to be the vicar of Thrumpton in Nottinghamshire, just down the road from Hucknall. Barber's argument for opening the vault was scholarly. He claimed it was to establish some archaeological points of general interest with regard to the existence or otherwise of a crypt in the church. He is at pains to say that it wasn't open for the sake of morbid curiosity, but I get the sense that he was protesting a little too much. It appears that the vault was constructed in the 1630s for the first Lord Byron, and the first person to be buried within it was the first Lord's wife Cecile in 1638. The first Lord Byron had built this burial vault at Hucknall to replace his family's traditional burial place at Colwick on the southeastern edge of Nottingham, where his family had owned the hall since the 14th century. Increasingly, the family were living at Newstead Abbey, a couple of miles from Hucknall, rather than at Colwick, and in 1660 the second baron sold Colwick entirely. It was this new focus on Newstead that was the motivation for the vault's construction. The vault at Hucknall was constructed under the floor of the chancel of the church, just to the south of the communion table in the sanctuary. And you can see its position in this print of the old church at Hucknall. The rings on the floor beneath the medieval sedilia mark the spot. In the 1880s, the medieval church was almost entirely demolished and rebuilt on a much grander scale. And the vault ended up in its present position, which is at the west end of the Victorian chancel. Canon Barber planned the opening of the vault in June of 1938 in a discreet and organised manner. Very few people in Hucknall knew it was even taking place. He brought in a number of specialists to work with him to ensure that the work was undertaken well and the contents examined with scholarly rigour. An antiquarian, Mr John Holland Walker, was present to record the contents and Mr N. M. Lane, the diocesan surveyor, attended to look at any structural issues and to produce detailed plans of the vault. Dr T. L. Llewellyn of Nottingham was present as an anatomist, and Mr Claude Bullock, the local photographer, came along to capture images of the open vault. Also in attendance on the day was the local MP, Mr F. Seymour Cox, the church wardens and the secretary of the church council. A mason called Mr J.C. Woodsend was employed to do the physical labour and he was assisted by two brothers, Robert and James Bettridge. The entrance to the vault, the large stone in its rings, was found under the chancel steps and was lifted. Under it, a short flight of steps appeared that led down from the west to a very small chamber measuring only 7 foot 6 by 6 foot wide. It was vaulted with stone slabs. The vault contained only six intact coffins. There was scarce room for any more. Five were stacked and one, that of an infant, lay separately just at the bottom of the steps. The floor of the vault was found to be covered in coffin debris and disarticulated bones. One of the coffins, that of the fourth Lord Byron's wife Frances Bentinck, who died in 1714, was found to be placed upon a six foot deep layer of debris at the far end of the vault, which were primarily the remains of broken up lead coffins. It is not uncommon in such burial vaults below churches for debris like this to accumulate and for there to be a kist or a bin built into the floor, a deep opening into which disarticulated bones might be placed therefore allowing the periodic clearing and rearrangement of a small vault like this to admit new coffins without removing the remains of the former occupants. There must be some form of a bone kist here, and it is most probably under the pile of debris, for we know that 27 Byrons were buried in this small space between 1638 and 1858. The lower row of coffins were found to be those of the poet's great uncle and predecessor, William V Lord, who died in 1798, and the poet's mother, Catherine Gordon, who died in 1811. William has become known to posterity as the wicked or devil Lord Byron, 
for during his time the Byron's family fortunes fell on hard times. The poet's coffin rested on top of that of the wicked lord, while the coffin of Ada, Countess Lovelace, the poet's only child, an accomplished mathematician, rested on top of Catherine Gordon's coffin. The brass coffin plates helped identify the occupants. There are quite a number of coffin plates in the vault from now destroyed coffins. They were lying loose. The coffin of Lady Lovelace was easy to identify. Her coffin plate was still affixed to it and on top was a countess's coronet made of gilt base metal. Such funerary coronets were de rigueur for the aristocracy in this period. The coffin plate of the poet had become detached from his coffin but was still present tucked behind. But Barber and his associates were able to identify the coffin by the baron's coronet lying on top of it and the baron's coronets decorating the coffin handles. Both coffins were typical products of the age and were presumably provided by one of the London undertakers. That of the poet was covered in the remains of purple velvet. Barber presumed that the small lead coffin at the foot of the stairs, that of a child, was of the infant Ernest Byron, grandson of the second lord, who died and was buried there in 1671. This coffin was crushed at the foot end by the weight of a small cube-shaped chest placed on it. This chest was the poet's urn and it was covered in purple velvet and adorned with brass nails and ornaments to match his coffin. On it was seen a brass inscription stating that within was the heart, brains, etc. of Lord Byron. Etc. means that it contained the poet's entrails too. We don't talk about that. The lid opened and within it Barber found a sealed lead case with another brass plate with the first inscription repeated. Canon Barber descended the steps into the vault twice during the course of the evening. His second visit was made at midnight with the photographer, the caretaker of the church hall and a member of the church council. On examining Byron's oak coffin more closely on this second visit, Barber discovered that the lid was loose, something that Holland Walker had noticed too when he was doing his careful recording work in the vault earlier in the evening. And it's also attested by the photographs. On lifting the lid, Barber found that the lead shell within the outer oak case had been cut open too. It seemed clear to him that someone had deliberately opened the coffin to see Lord Byron's remains. I will let Barber's words reflect his thoughts. A horrible fear came over me that souvenirs might have been taken from the coffin. The idea was revolting, but I could not dismiss it. Had the body itself been removed? Terrible thought. Within the lead case, as you'd expect, Barber found there was another internal coffin of wood and that the lid of this was loose. Barber's curiosity got the better of him and he raised the lid and found himself face to face with the embalmed body of Lord Byron. He states that he found the body in perfect condition and that Byron's features were recognisable from portraits of the age. He had a serene, almost happy expression on his face, he says. His body was covered, apart from his feet and ankles, and because of that, Barber was able to establish by looking at these that the disability that had caused Byron's lameness in life was of his right foot. Barber says the whole experience of seeing Byron's body made a deep impression on him. He gently lowered the lid and offered a prayer for the poet as he did so. Recent images of the interior of the Byron vault taken in 2014 show clearly that the lid of the poet's coffin to the right in the photograph is loose and it is more or less as it appears in the 1938 photos although the coronet is now further down the coffin presumably it is where Barber placed it in 1938. It isn't clear when somebody first opened Byron's coffin or what their motivation was perhaps it was in the 1880s when the church was rebuilt. This brings me on to rather a twist in this tale. In the 1960s, a young journalist called Byron Rogers, who was then writing for the Sheffield Star, became really interested in the story 
of the 1938 opening and obtained a copy of Barber's account. He then rang up the vicar of Hognall to ask him if there was anyone in his parish still living who remembered the opening of the vault and could corroborate Barber's account. As it turned out, there was someone who claimed he was there and was happy to speak to the journalist. His name was Arnold Holdsworth. He died in 1979. Holdsworth is not among the careful list of people that Barber refers to as being present, but he claims to have been a companion of Jim Betteridge, who Barber says was there, and that he was one of the people who did the labouring work to lift the slab. Byron Rogers went to interview Holdsworth and received some rather shocking revelations in the process. Holdsworth claimed that once the hard work of opening the vault was completed, the vicar and his guests went off for their evening meal, leaving the churchwarden, him and Betteridge to wait for their return. They were both a bit miffed by this, but as they were waiting around, they decided to go down to the vault and take a look. Despite attempting to prevent him, Holdsworth says that Betteridge decided to break through the outer case of Byron's coffin, through the lead shell and in a coffin with his spade, and they both saw Byron's body. He says that Byron looked just like in the portraits, words that echo those of Barber's written account, but that the corpse was entirely naked. The body was in good condition, he says, though parts of it were skeletonized. Byron was bone from the elbows to the hands and from the knees down. The nakedness of the corpse and the partial skeletonization both contradict Barber's account. Holtz was said that Byron was a good-looking man, that he was putting on a bit of weight and had gone bald. Then waiting for his wife to leave the room, Holdsworth let slip the juiciest morsel of the interview. Tapping a spot above his knee in the region of his own genitals, he told Rogers that Byron was built like a pony and that as an ex-army man he'd seen plenty of male genitalia in the wash house to which he could compare. Well, however humorous it might be to talk of a dead poet's phallus, and I avoided mentioning it in the title of the video for fear of cries of clickbait, a few things just don't quite add up for me about this account from Holdsworth. Firstly, Barber makes a very careful list of all the people present, and Holdsworth's name is not on that list, although Betteridge is it is. Looking at the census and other documents, Betteridge is listed as a labourer, but Holdsworth wasn't. He was a 40-year-old bank security clerk in 1938. So why was he in the church helping Betteridge? There are issues with the timing too. Barber gives a very clear time frame in his account of how the work progressed, and it is one of incessant, well-planned activity. The intention was to do this work quickly and discreetly. The mason and his assistants began their work at 4pm, the chancel steps took an hour to lift, then the slab an hour and a quarter. By this time the photographer had arrived and once the vault was open he set up two large reflective lamps to illuminate the interior. Then Barber himself went immediately into the vault, followed quickly by Lane the surveyor to measure the vault and do his geo drawings and Holland Walker to do his careful work of recording. And then the photographer took the photos that are used to illustrate this video. It is very clear from these photographs that at this point, before Holdsworth claims he was left with his companion in the church, someone had already opened the coffin. You can see where the lid is loose on the left hand side of the photograph. There was a time indeed when Barber and his advisors went to the church hall to confer their notes and to work out how to proceed. They weren't going to supper as the work they were doing was urgent. This is the only time that Holdsworth and Betteridge could have entered the vault. Barber does say that various people present used this time as an opportunity to go into the vault. He means the church wardens, the MP, the church council member and Mr Woodsend and his men. There is only space for one or two people to enter the vault at any one time. And during this time the vault was illuminated, the interior would have been visible from the church floor. If the coffin had indeed been opened with the spade, breaking through oak and lead would have been time consuming and noisy work, drawing considerable attention and there would have been a good chance of anybody doing this being caught. 
any new damage to the coffin would have made Barber and others suspicious when they returned from their meeting for a second look inside the vault. Holdsworth claims that when he and Betteridge saw the body of Byron, he was completely naked. This does not accord with the account by Barber, who is clear that the body was covered apart from the feet. That is just how you might expect a dead body to be prepared for burial in this era. People were not buried naked. They were usually dressed in open-ended shrouds or grave clothes. Byron's body had laid in repose with the coffin open in Greece for some days. He would have been dressed during this laying in repose. I think it is possible that Holdsworth was present when the vault was opened, but why he isn't mentioned by name by Barber, who is meticulous in his account of the work, even thanking the workmen by name, is inexplicable. I think Holdsworth's story is highly improbable. The very close planning and tight timing of the whole work and the presence of others, some of them responsible and distinguished men, would have made it virtually impossible for anybody to open the coffin with the spade. Let not the facts get in the way of a good yarn, they say, but I personally think the outrageous claim about the size of Lord Byron's genitalia was simply Mr Holdsworth having a bit of a joke and seeking his five minutes of fame. Thanks very much for watching. If you enjoy this channel, you're bound to enjoy my magazine, The Antiquary. Published every month, it is a labour of love for me, and in it I explore some of the more obscure aspects of our shared history, all beautifully illustrated in full colour. It chips across the world, is offered in print and digital format, and readers give it five stars on Google. If you love your history like me, particularly the history of objects, buildings, people and places, why not consider subscribing? Subscribing helps support my work and the channel too. There's a link above and in the video description that takes you to the magazine website.